Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I would really like to thank the Peace and Development Foundation and its partners for the invitation to be here. And what I would like to do this morning is really to share with you some of um, the research results on the link between climate change, air pollution, and inequality, and provide hopefully loads of interesting local examples on how that plays out in, in reality. Well, the first outcome of the research, not only of UNRIST research, but also of you know, the Lancet Commission, for example, is that air pollution and climate change are closely linked and therefore also share common solutions. Um, and one of the facts that uh, uh, really the outcome of the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health is that the fossil fuel combustion in high income countries and also the burning of biomass in low income countries account for more than 80% of airborne pollution. So that is already showing the very, very strong link. And that the distribution is uh, not equal because nearly 92% uh, of pollution related deaths occur in low income and middle income countries with children being uh, very much uh, exposed to the effect of pollution and chemicals. Um, the other really important message coming out of research is that air pollution is a major cause of premature death and disease. Um, in Europe, it's the single largest environmental health risk, which is causing more than 400,000 premature deaths per year. It's 10 times, oh, sorry, next, yeah. next, yeah. Um, it's 10 times higher than the number of deaths caused by car accidents. So that is really kind of, uh, I think, very shocking. Uh, and that it really occurs in the poorest and least educated and, and, and most jobless regions in, in, in Europe. Um, and the recent study just that came out uh, now in October shows also that long-term exposure to air pollution may be very much linked to 15% of the COVID-19 deaths globally. Um, so I think here again we see uh, that there is a very strong link um, between air pollution, health, uh, and inequality. Next, please. Um, we also see that sorry. we also see that there is uh, a strong evidence coming out of research that the uh, the poor bear the major cost of uh, pollution. Uh, for example, in London, 50% of the poor areas surpass the EU's nitrogen dioxide limits, compared with only 2% of the wealthiest areas in London. And, you know, the deputy mayor of London in, in 2017 said, you know, this really shows that there is a vast inequality in London between the richest and the poorest areas, while the richest owe more cars, um, the, the worst air quality is where there is least uh, car ownership in the poor areas. So that kind of means for her uh, that they have a moral obligation on the mayor to act. Uh, so here I think a very clear example of inequality caused by air pollution and, you know, and its impact on the health of the poor. Uh, the next, I think, is also very interesting. I mean, we all know about the Yellow West movement. Um, and here it's really showing not only that the costs of environmental and climate change and related policies are unevenly distributed, but they're also linked to structural pre-existing inequalities. Um, as you probably all know the Yellow West movement was very much driven by the rising food prices uh, due to the tax legislations. Um, and they were claiming that the tax reforms were falling on the working and middle class, especially in the rural areas of France. Um, and what's interesting is that most of the protesters wanted to fight climate change, um, but they were opposing that the working class and the poor should pay for the pollution caused by larger multinational companies. And therefore their demand was broader. It was really to link social and environmental policy by increasing the minimum wages, by lowering the full tax, and by reestablishing a solidarity tax on wealth. 
Um, so I think these are the kind of broader demands that came out of this movement that shows clearly that there is a need for integrated policies. Um, I think the Energiewende in Germany is an, an, another example of how you can actually link social and environmental policy um, and that climate change is really a political issue. Um, for example, in Germany, the eco taxes that were first implemented through pilot project allowed for a very strong popular participation. Uh, for example, you know, homes were able to sell solar energy and put it into the grid. Um, and that led to an increased use of renewable energy uh, and also to job creation at the local level. Uh, I think this is very much reflected in very high approval rates, around 80% of the population uh, of the energy vendor in Germany. Um, but there's also a very high number of the population that is concerned with equality aspects of the energy vendor. Um, 73% of the population wants um, poorer families to have adequate access to energy services without having to pay more. Tenants not to face increased rents. Um, and then they also want big polluters to pay higher taxes. So I think that's again a very interesting uh, example of, you know, that there is a need to involve the population early on. Um, then UNRIST especially, and of course ILO, other uh, local initiatives have been working very much on the concept of just transition. Um, and I think the idea is that uh, combating climate change and ensuring just transition at the local level can have different uh, phases to it. One is the phase of kind of, okay, we keep the status quo and we provide some compensation for affected coal miners, for example. I think that's the one, let's not rock the boat. The second one is including some managerial reform. Uh, so enhancing workers' rights, improving social protection, and some distribution of benefits and costs uh, from combating climate change. A more ambitious level then is the structural reform to really also trying to uh, address inclusion uh, and include people into decision making. So a very strong aspect also is procedural justice here. And then I think the most ambitious form of just transition is really this fundamental overhaul of the economic and political system uh, to lead or result in a, a eco-social just society. Um, so here there are a few examples. I mean, there is the book by Unrest on Just Transition done with partners, which provides very different examples from the local level. And the one uh, that we found most transformative and uh, also most inclusive is an example from Jackson in the USA, uh, where there is a community uh, that really engaged themselves in just transition in all its aspect, you know, uh, providing alternative, cooperative economic alternatives, um, having a mayor that was politically uh, pushing for just transition agenda, uh, and then really having a participation from different parts of the community in the planning and in the agenda uh, of the just transition. Then we have things also like the just transition mechanism of the European Green Deal. Uh, here the idea is also to include local businesses, local governments and the population as much as possible and to provide them with financing opportunities. Uh, and then maybe the ones that is really about more about containing the, the status quo, maintaining it, um, is the compensation for fossil fuel workers in South Africa and uh, providing new opportunities for them through green bonds. So I think there are different parts of the spectrum um, and uh, I think it depends also very much on the ambition and the situation in each locality to see what the, the best choice is. Um, then we um, do often an analysis of the local struggles for just transition and their potential to advance climate justice. Um, I think also here in Germany, there was recently this debate, you know, how can the trade unions and the Fridays for Future, for example, work more together? And it's really just transition works better if there is a broad-based coalition 
including uh, trade unions, representation of workers, even the informal workers, hopefully, and environmental activists. So it's not like jobs versus the environment. It's really how can we create new jobs um, that uh, benefit also the poor and the marginalized parts of society. Um, often there is a weakening commitment to climate action at the national level. We have seen quite a few populist governments uh, not supporting international climate action in the last years. Um, so the local governments can actually take a center stage uh, in the global low carbon transition. You know, I've provided this example from Jackson in the US. Um, so maybe while there might be at the national level a weak commitment, you know, some of the local communities have been very strong in providing alternatives um, and, and showing what a Green Deal could look like. And the idea is now how can we upscale that and gain political support? Because in the long term, of course, and given the urgency of climate change, uh, there needs to be fast and fair national and global policies, uh, otherwise that will not work. Um, and then I think one of the really important uh, aspects of local just transition initiatives is that they offer opportunities for people's participation, consultation and inclusion, um, often more than the higher uh, levels of governance. You know, when I was saying that the European Green Deal, the just transition mechanism was, you know, quite high on the inclusiveness, I think that's the ambition. But now we have to see, you know, will that be really the reality or is it a top-down policy and how will that play out in, in reality? Um, so I think there is this tension between the local and the national level and the global level. But in the end, uh, really, there is a need for urgent action at, at all levels. So what can we do given this situation? Well, one of the important recommendations from the Lancet study is really to in integrate pol uh, pollution challenges uh, and, and climate action into planning processes early on and do that in an integrated manner. Uh, in developing countries to also include uh, support uh, from development assistance agencies <coughs> to make sure that there are integrated policies that can be implemented. Um, and then end, of course, government such, uh, subsidies and tax breaks for polluting industries. That is really, really important. Um, I think local policies can also very much and should address distributional consequences of climate change mitigation. So those that we saw earlier related to the energy prices, um, the industrial restructuring, you know, how can we really um, give subsidies or support uh, green industries and then also changes in the job market by providing new skills and by providing uh, job opportunities in, in the new just and green sector. Um, then also the whole idea about participation and inclusive governance is very important. We've seen that when policies are top down, uh, then often protest movements form. I think the yellow vests are a good example of that. So it's very important to provide for participation at the local level at an early stage. Um, and then really the idea of a rights-based approach. Rights-based approach means non-discrimination, equality, empowerment of local communities, um, especially in a context uh, where countries are using market-based mechanisms and green economy policies. So to make sure that there is a real participation uh, and that there is really empowerment included in those policies. Um, and I think there is another interesting initiative uh, suggested by the Lancet report. Um, there is this website, www.pollution.org, where people can actually uh, review data related to the pollution in their neighborhoods and connect with others for joint initiatives. I think that is really, really interesting. Uh, and what UNRIST and of course other organizations, including of course here in the Bonn Symposium are doing, is to really exchange with another and learn from other communities. Um, and I invite you, next slide please, uh, to look at the work of UNRIST, uh, which has some very interesting examples of cities in transition. Next slide please. 
we see uh, the locals struggle for a just transition in different cities, in communities, uh, and you know what has really triggered these social movements, how successful have they been, and how can they uh, learn from each other in the future. Mm -hmm.